This is the Way Podcast. If you want to know more about the Way Podcast, go to podcasttheway.com. Thank you again to Three Interesting Things Podcast for that new introduction. And again, this is FM 91.7 WHUS stores at the top of the hour. I'm your host, Bill Trofeski, and today we're going to be talking about the spine. I'm sitting today with Bartolome, Juan yeah. Bartolome. I'm sitting today with Dr. Juan Bartolome. So how are you doing today, doctor? I'm doing good, thank you. I hope you're doing safe and healthy from the virus. I hope the same with you too. We're both over in Connecticut, so we fared better than a lot of other states, but compared to the world, America could improve. Absolutely. So um, what kind of doctor are you? I'm actually a neurosurgeon. I'm a, an assistant clinical professor at the Department of Yale Medical School, and I'm the co-medical director of the Yale Spine Center. Nice. And I heard um, you're impressive in your field. Uh, in 2013, you were actually named a top U.S. News and World's Report doctor. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. How did that feel? It, it felt pretty good. You know, it's a, it's a nice recognition to have. Uh, and so uh, I'm honored to have that uh, the title believe it i'm a mechanical engineer i know four years of college was real hard <laughs> let alone going for your doctorate let alone actually performing in the work so congratulations with that thank you i'm actually about medical engineer so i, 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 know, I know the pain that you went through too <laughs> oh it can get brutal at times <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah particularly the last two years <laughs> oh yeah definitely <laughs> I might go for my master's. I know uh, maybe even an MBA because I know some jobs offer that. I just recently graduated, so it's hard with the whole epidemic, but the economy will turn around. Yes, it will. And uh, an MBA is a great thing to have no matter where you, what field you are. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's good to hear. So how did you start? How did you get into your field? Well, I, I, um, I went to... Uh, 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 university, uh, Marquette University up in Milwaukee, and, and it wasn't known at that time, but mostly for basketball. And uh, Yep, uh, UConn over here with the uh, Big East rivalry now that we're back in the division. <laughs> that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, so I'm a Big East fan as well too, so uh, I'm glad to see them coming back uh, into, the, <laughs> into the division, so that's wonderful. Oh, I follow it religiously, especially with uh, that close game we had against Creighton over time. That was a great game. That was a great game. I saw that too. I, I got that FS1 and I watch it every every time I can. And it's a good marathon to, to watch great basketball. Back 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so I went to Marquette University and I, I, uh, I, I chose the field of uh, medical engineering at that time because it was uh, very challenging and, and uh, I just wasn't sure whether I could make it to medical school, to be honest with you. And, um, and I, I felt like, uh, you know, when you challenge yourself, then you always have a backup plan just in case things don't work out. So you had some of that uh, imposter syndrome. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> That's right. I'm hearing that word thrown around a lot, so I wanted to throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so it was it was a it was a great uh, it's a great field to to uh, back then you know back in the 80s I graduated in 89. It was mostly mechanical or electrical engineering, but there was all these advances coming up with the computers and the conductors and things like that that uh, that made it into incredible field and then I I started medical school <clears throat> I got I was blessed to to be accepted at Yale and so I, I got great mentors that uh, that helped me to get there and and, uh, and then <clears throat> part of the the Yale medical school curriculum was to write a thesis you have to you have to write a thesis and I'm I, I'm not I wasn't good at writing I, that was one of my weaknesses I, I'm from Puerto Rico originally so English was you know Quite challenging to begin with and then having to write a, a thesis was a, a great challenge in itself <clears throat> and i Same was here i know the feeling of being a bad writer why i picked up engineering <laughs> 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 only <laughs> numbers no words <laughs> only numbers exactly or, or programming uh, that, that programming was like a, a brand new thing back then so it was oh programming that. was evil for me especially python <laughs> yeah, but back then it was Fortran and C plus. That's that's what we had back then. So yeah, and I hear Python's the easy one too. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. So so it was it was a uh, it was a uh, you know you always go for the challenge, and so um, I got you uh, so part of the challenge was to try to get into 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 writing a thesis, and I I, I met this incredible mentor literally in the hallway by by mistake, uh, and it was Dr. Charles Greer who was. Uh, 
part of the, he is still part of the Department of Neurosurgery, but he was doing great research in spinal cord regeneration and uh, trying to, you know, trying to cure paralysis. And, um, and, and he put me under his wing and we were doing some great uh, work in terms of what happens when a cell dies and do we develop those synapses again? Do we develop those connectivities again? And, and, uh, and then he introduced me to Dr. Spencer, who's uh, my boss, uh, my, my mentor, who was the chairman at that time of neurosurgery. And, uh, and he got me into an operating room when I was like a second year medical student. I saw the brain and, and I realized uh, that that was, that was you know, the most complex structure organ and, and that we still don't know much about it uh, and the intricacies of it. And, and being able to understand a little bit better with the research that we did. And so it was just a great journey. And so I was you know, fortunate to be accepted to the program there. And so I did the residency uh, uh, at Yale as well too. So, so it was, uh, it, it's been a really good journey. And then I, was, uh, I did a fellowship in spine. I actually spent some time in London with a very famous neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Cro Mr. Mr. Alan Crocker. Uh, uh, back then, and I realized the spine is a field that can apply some of the engineering concepts. Uh, but, but boy, was I wrong because you don't understand the structure as well in pain. Uh, and and I just got fascinated by that whole field. And, and but you see, like the engineering sort of forces at play, whatnot, but you can't factor in the human pain or exactly. Or exactly. You know, it, it, I always say if, we, if I could have the manual, you know, you're engineers, right? But we, we, there's a problem, there's a solution, different ways to get to it, but you all get a solution. In, in medicine, you think you have the solution. You know the problem, but there's so many ways and you get so short because you, we're so complex. And I always wish I could have that manual for each one of us to say, okay, this is your problem, this is what we can do. And, and I bet each person has their own solution. So this book might work on this person, but then you try the same treatment and nothing. And that's, that's exactly the art of spine care. <laughs> it's a, it's a, you, you think you've seen it, you think you look at it, you think the MRI gives you the answer, and you do exactly the same thing, and outcomes are totally different, absolutely. And, and so it becomes, it becomes a challenge. It becomes a challenge in itself. And, and over time, you, 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 we all learn, uh, as the field has evolved in the 90s, 2000s, uh, how, how, how we're beginning to understand a little bit better, but it's still not what we want it to be. And, and it becomes a, a, a source of challenge uh, 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 to, to look forward to, to try to be able to find that answer or that manual that, that we can all homogenize everybody with. So, so, uh, so it's, uh, it, it had the concepts of, of mechanical engineering, but not quite there because there's so many structures uh, that depend upon the spine, that it uh, becomes a, a, a big endeavor that we're going to be working for a long time. I can see that. I um, actually have a note right here. When I was looking into uh, your website of, at Yale and looking up your, was it, oh, profile, that's what I'm trying to think of. I saw a quote that said, you believe it's important to understand the dynamics of the entire system versus just the spine. And the reason I find that so interesting is one of the reasons I got into podcasting is I read this book called Range by uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And it's all about why it's a different topic, but similar, why people need to be generalists versus specialists sometimes. Yeah. Now you're a doctor, so you're very specialized and that's absolutely needed. You want somebody who knows the spine, but if somebody's a working something in the economics or business end, they might want some psychology to sort of give you a general combine it to get better in your field. But one of the problems in the book that I talked about with doctors is a lot of them like to become so specialized and focus on one part of the human body that they'll make a mistake and they'll focus so much on the toe they forget the heel or something like that. So when you're working on the spine, it's good that you're actually seeing the entire system. Yeah, and, and that's that's how you know, we we miss the trees for the forest. It's, it's a development of spine. When you think about how we how we at least I the way I see it is. But when you see the technology that has evolved over time, uh, uh, for example, MRIs came out in the 1980s and we start seeing anatomy like we've never seen it before. Uh, suddenly you really see the details of the, the, the spinal cord, the, the nerves, uh, the, the brain, the disc itself too. You know, we always had an x-ray or a casting and that, that kind of shows more shadows of the bone and the height of different 
uh, structures, but when you really start seeing the intricacies of, of all these soft tissues, because that, that's what the MRI does, you start thinking, wow, look at look at that bulging disc. I, I wonder if that bulging disc is causing the problem. So at the same time, uh, the technology started focusing on putting screws to stabilize the spine, thinking that perhaps if we unbulge the disc, then we can cure pain. But but what happened is that when we fused uh, or, or you know, uh, change the dynamics of a portion of the spine, it, it's a domino effect because the other the other structures compensate for the hips, uh, the, the the neck, uh, you know. So if we do a fusion in the lower back, the patient starts compensating by trying to lift their head up, uh, so they can see the horizon. But that puts an enormous amount of stress at the levels in the lower back, and so people ended up with having also back pain, and, and that's why you really got to see. The whole picture you got to see how the patient is walking and how pitch forward they are or backwards or what their hips are doing to to be able to say you know we need to put the shoulders at top of the hip we need to put the head at top of the shoulders and that's what the development occurred because we were just missing those lower trees in the lower back and not really focusing on the the rest of the spine and that's why we have to see the whole the whole structures as well too so are you against sort of this uh, spinal fusion as treatment? No, well, it, it depends. It, it depends. You know, you definitely, there's a bit, there's a role in everything that we do. But I, I caution uh, very carefully to try, to, I call it, don't, don't treat the MRI specifically. Because when you, when you have low back pain, you get an MRI of the lower back. And, and, and we all, we all develop degeneration of our spine. We all fight time and gravity. So we put all these structures under a lot of stress. And so we all have bulging discs. We all have some degree of degeneration, but not all of us have back pain. And, and, and pointing the finger at just one little thing, you have to be careful because we know that back pain can be from a bad ankle, a bad knee, a bad hip. It, it, there are all these other structures that make us compensate, and, and they're called the, the spine, the equalizer. Uh, I'm sorry, but how can a bad ankle, or I, I guess I would see a bad knee, but how can like something all the way down there affect your spine like that? Well, start start with a bad ankle. What do you start? You start actually. Let me give a perfect example. My wife had foot surgery, and and she started wearing a boot, and that completely offset her gait, her balance. And next thing you know, she was having back pain. And as soon as that boot came out and she did some rehab, some physical therapy, she was able to rebalance herself up again. Uh, and, and I just made an experiment with her. I just bought another boot for the other foot so that she could be perfectly balanced and actually worked out pretty well. And I realized once you get that boot off, it will be okay. So it depends on our gait. It depends on the whole structure as we try to fight time and gravity and create a balance uh, on ourselves to be able to look at the horizon. So a lot of little things can change the way that we, 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 we try to balance each other and, and the back becomes the equalizer. Okay, I can see that. What, um, I, it was a trend a while ago, people would wear those shoes that were, you, gotcha. know, toes, you know what I'm talking about with the toes sticking out those? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was thinking about a little earlier, but I, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, it um, it's basically like a sock that just really tightly wraps around your feet. Your toes stick out, and you're supposed to run around on the balls of your feet, to, or even walk around on the balls of your feet. Because I guess the idea was a long time ago, before shoes, humans would have to walk around on the balls of their feet. While now with the shoes on, we go heel to toe. And I guess the heel impact is supposed to be unhealthy for our knees or joints or even spine. Is there any like science to that, or is that all we're trying to make some money? I, I, well, I, I'm not familiar with, but but I, you know, everybody's body's different. So I like always said, whatever works for you, if it works, keep going. At it, you know, and uh, but but everybody's everybody's very different, and you, you cannot only see the 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 heel or the or the, or the ball of the foot. You got to see, got to see. Are they hunched forward? You know, are there are there you know what the pelvis tilt is like and things like that. And so it's uh, everybody's different, and, and that's why I always say I, I'm open to anything as long as it works and doesn't cause you pain. I remember hearing too. Is it true that like every inch your head arches forward, it adds what was it like ten pounds to your spine or something along those lines? I, I, I don't know the exact numbers because it depends on the on the and the and the, uh, and the 
body uh, of the individuals, you know, somebody with, with uh, a, you know, pretty big belly type of thing, you know, it always can, it depends on your curvature of, of your thoracic spine and things like that. But clearly that, that's one thing that we learn over time is we always want to look at the horizon. So we always will compensate by trying to look up and, and what's from the head down, uh, it, 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 everybody's different in many ways. And so you, you're always trying to maintain that balance. And, and yes, we learn over time, uh, it's called sagittal balance. You know, when you move forward, you're pitching yourself in a way that you're putting an enormous amount of stress in the lower back. The numbers, I'm not quite sure, but it, it's clearly something that we learn over time because as we fused all these backs over time, uh, people were compensating in such a way that they were creating a lot more deformities uh, that were caused by the surgeries that we did in the past. And so now we're correcting those deformities by, by trying to put, again, the, 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 the shoulders on the hips and the head on the shoulder type of thing. So the stress from leaning forward or something along those lines could, over time, infect your spine or cause damage? Exactly. And, you know, you're, you're a mechanical engineer, and imagine a, a, a tower leaning forward. You know where the stress is being applied to, and, and you know that the compensatory stress is in the fulcrum of those forces that are being applied to. And you know those, those things can break over time. Well, actually, speaking of that, too, I was watching a YouTube video, and it was the most common fractured, uh, what are they called, discs or, yeah, do you know, I'm drawing a blank, what's the, vertebrae. Vertebrae, yeah, yeah. So the bone, the vertebrae, and then in between, you have the disc is made out of cartilage. So, so bone is really solid, you know, it's calcium, and the disc is made of a, of a much softer uh, uh, material called the uh, uh, cartilage, actually, it, it's what it is. Uh, and a different type of cartilage, so a really tough one. Imagine uh, taking a radial tire, and you turn it into the, you know, you drop it on the ground and then you have the real tough radial fibers absorbing all the pressures from those vertebras, cement blocks put it. And then in between, you put a little softer cartilage called the, the, the nucleus pulposus that it actually, it's, it's a much uh, gelatinous material. It's not, it's not like jelly, like it was, it's actually crab meat. It looks like crab meat. But those, 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 they kind of soften up so low, but over time, that internal cartilage becomes uh, less hydrated, less water. And over time, the outer, you know, imagine just jumping on that radial tire for years and years and years. Those radial fibers start breaking up, they become weaker. And so that's what causes, you know, the bulging discs that we have. Uh, and so, uh, and so that, that's, that's what we're composed of. It's uh, the vertebrae is a bone. The disc is made out of two types of cartilage, a tough annular wall, and then the softer disc in between. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. We're going to say the type of fractures that you read. Sounds good. No, no problem. That was educational, too. Like you mentioned with the engineering, like uh, buildings on angle, there's more stress towards the side it's leaning on. I saw that the, if it's, if I'm saying this right, the T8 is the most fractured vertebrae. Yeah, it, well, it's the, what they call a thoracolumbar. Yeah, so, so the spine is also, there, there are three parts of the spine. There's a cervical, which is the neck, which is a lot of motion. You know, you have to look side to side, up and down. And there's the thoracic, that is the chest cavity. And that's a solid structure. It does cause a lot of motion. Um, and then there's a lumbar, which is a lower back, which also has a lot of motion. And, and what happens is these transitional zones, you know, the cervical and thoracic, the top part, you, when you have those transitional zones with movement, no movement, um, and also in the lumbar spine, the thoracal lumbar spine, where there's no movement, thoracic, a lot of movement in the lumbar, those tend to have the highest incidence. If you fall down, well, the, the forces are forcing you to go, you know, you, your head goes forward and you crunch those lower segments and because you have some more motion, uh, most people have more motion in the lumbar spine, then the area that has the transitional zones are the ones that get affected from a mechanical standpoint. And so, the, yes, uh, so there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, usually T10, 11, 12, L1, tend to have the most uh, 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 affliction of the stresses when we fall down. We call it compression fractures. This is very common now. And as the patient population is getting older, uh, you know, we become more, the bone becomes less strong and osteoporosis, osteopenia, and those are the type of fractures that we tend to see in that area. Okay. Yeah, what I was going to say is looking at it from even like a civil engineering standpoint, the spine just sort of bends and that T 
well that vertebrae i mentioned is right in the middle of it yeah looking at a bridge it just makes sense that's where most of the stress would go and cause the fracture exactly exactly and and, and what happens is that you might fracture that vertebra a lot of patients complain of lower back pain even though it's in the middle of the thoracic spine they complain about lower pain why because the muscles are yeah. to hold you up and so that's why it's like a kind of transfer of forces yeah Oh, that's odd. There's no uh, like nerves in that vertebrae that say, "Hey, this part hurts." It's just the stress in the lower part. Lower part. Understanding. Exactly. So, so you don't you don't affect necessarily the nerves when you. I mean, yes, the bad fractures. Yes, if it compresses on the nerve, you're gonna have a lot of shooting pain down the legs or the front of the chest. But a lot of people experience uh, what we call axial, right in the axis of the spine, pain, and that's because the muscles are saying, "Hey, listen, we need to stabilize this segment." Uh, we need some help here. And so that's why a lot of people have a lot of muscle spasms along the spine. So it's not necessarily, and you bring a good point that when, when we think about pain, a lot of us think is of a pinched nerve. If I go into the spine and I go in and pinch that nerve, most people will experience shooting pain down along that distribution of the nerve. So every nerve goes into a different part of our chest, our lower back, into the legs, and different parts of our foot Feet, I'm sorry. And so, and so when people have pain right there along the back, along those muscles, it's usually what we call mechanical back pain. And that's, that's a tough one because a lot of people experience a lot of mechanical back pain, even without a fracture. And that, that's where the challenge comes in and trying to help those patients. Wow. Yeah, I saw um, back pain is actually the sixth reason people go to see their doctors. Yes, I think it's changed over time because it used to be, uh, you know, 80% of people develop back pain. It used to be the second most after the cold, but now with coronavirus, I think the numbers are changing quickly. Oh, definitely, I can see that. Yeah. And building off of that, I think I was a kid and I was playing baseball. And I guess I'll ask about your feeling chiropractors in a minute. Yeah. I went to a chiropractor and I had a pain in my shoulder or something along that line towards my arm. And he told me I had a dislocated rib or which mm -hmm. doesn't sound, looking back, is that accurate? Well, I guess my question is, pain in your legs, arms, et cetera, that could be the result of your spine. And is that example I gave you something that could actually have been from my spine or rib, or was that chiropractor just trying to sell some cracking in my back? Well, well, I, I listen, I, I believe in chiropractors. Uh, and we all have our different backgrounds of, of treatment and our, 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 the way that we, 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 we were taught. Um, and I, I, I am... I'm a surgeon, and I always try to tell people, if you have back or neck pain, try to avoid surgery as much as you can. So I hope, I hope you respect that, that, that philosophy, because <laughs> as a surgeon, I'm trying to tell you to try to avoid it as much as you can. Um, uh, there are different concepts out there. Uh, there. There are different philosophies, and I, I truly respect them immensely. And like I, like I told you earlier, if it works, keep going. You know, I, I, I'm also a strong believer of, of doing the right exercises. Uh, and that's where the therapist also physical therapists come into play to be able to see uh, the whole network of structures working together and trying to develop a program uh, on which the patient can build upon themselves on a daily basis and be able to strengthen their core, strengthen the musculature. I have, I have a shoulder issue. And when that thing flares up, and I know what I have, I have bicep tendonitis which is brutal. And when that thing flares up, my neck pain comes in with a vengeance. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. And, and I know, and I know my neck. I, I know, I, you know, I know my MRI, and I, I know I don't have a pinched nerve. But, but any any structure that uh, attached to the spine can affect neck pain, back pain, thoracic pain. And so, chiropractors, cupping, acupuncture, you, you name it. You know, massage therapists that's a lot better than me going in there and opening up and detaching the muscles and doing, you know, some major surgery. We do, we do have to do it. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's certain circumstances that we have to do it, yeah. but if it's neck pain or back pain, just, just be careful. And, and there's a wonderful array of physicians, uh, pain specialists, physiatrists that, that can do wonders in many ways. Sounds good. And one of the uh, reasons I even found you to come on the show is you're a strong advocate that surgery should be an like a last resort. It, it, it should be, no question about it, for the right reasons, though. Careful, because a, a lot of people, I get nervous when, when we're treating the MRIs. You know, if you have a degenerative disc disease, 
you have arthritis of your spine and then we go in and fuse the back and then again we change the dynamics of it and then we haven't really looked at the whole structure we haven't you know you gotta you gotta exhaust conservative measures and sometimes you have to be careful because sometimes unfortunately and i have this back surgery can give the patient worse back pain and it's it's this feeling that it, it's it's brutal to, to accept it so and so, you know, I, I've been in the business for 20 years and I learned from my mistakes and, and from what I've seen over time. And so um, a lot of people have that, you know, if it all fails, have back surgery. It's like, well, we'll be careful because once you change the dynamics of the spine, you cannot, you cannot undo them. Like, I cannot undo a fusion. And so you got to be careful. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but if somebody had screws screwed into their spine in other scenarios, you can't unscrew it. You can't take them out. Well, you, you can take them out, but the problem is that so so the the and, and, and there there's some there's some good evidence that when somebody has an instability of the spine with one vertebra slipping forward and pinching the nerves, going in there and and taking the pressure against the nerve to help with leg pain or or nerve or, or, or arm pain, and putting screws and rods to weld those vertebras together can be very very effective. But to your point is that, you know, when we do a construct, uh, you know, when you build a, you know, I'm from Puerto Rico, so everything's built as cement. So you put the rebarb in there and you put the, the, the cement around it to hold. So the cement is the bone, the cement is the bone, the rebar is the screws and rust that we put in. Yeah. You can take the rebar out, but it's just still fused, you see, the, 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 you know, everything's mm -hmm. welded together. So I have a plate in my arm right now because I broke my arm snowboarding. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if like they took out the plate right now, I could get surgery if I want to get it removed. But they say, why bother? Right. Exactly. I mean, unless the screw is pulling out, and you can see on your skin, or it's irritating, you know, the nerves in that area, and you you touch and it hurts, then, then maybe. But yeah, it, it, the, the the plate did its work. It made it made the the rebar did its work to make sure that the concrete, your bones, kind of come together. Yeah. So you're against unnecessary surgery, but are there any side effects of surgery that Say you know you could do this and you're not too worried about doing the surgery. Are you still trying to avoid any surgery or is it just in general? It, well, in general, I, I, you have to do it for the right reasons. So and that's the right reasons is very tricky because because when you when you talk to your neighbor and you have back pain and you have back surgery and you had a great result, well, everybody's different. And so there there are circumstances. You know, there, there we do surgery in the neck to try to prevent paralysis or or a badly pinched nerve that provides you weakness. I mean, you cannot sleep at night because the arm pain is so severe and you can see the bone spur going in. Well, you gotta take the bone spur out and you gotta fuse that part of the spine because you destabilize that. So so back pain, um, there's a lot of people that have silent fractures, I call it athlete's fractures, uh, that over time become unstable and they start pinching on the nerve. Well, those are great reasons to have that surgery. However- Your body's able to heal those spinal fractures on their own? No, because, because uh, you know, let's talk about your arm. The reason they put the plate in there is because they wanted to prevent you from moving. And so when a fracture heals with no motion, but if you have a loose bone there, let's keep moving and moving and moving, it's not going to heal well. Uh, and in the back, you can have these fractures without knowing them, and they never heal well. And then the, the load then turns into the disc and over time the disc degenerates, it collapses and then it can start shifting forward the vertebra and pinching the nerve. Right. If you work out on time, which they usually don't, uh, then you can actually fix it right then and there. And not, not you know, came out to you, it's like, do you want to take the plates or the screws out? And you say, no, because it's fine. But again, what I warn people is that when you have a fusion, just be aware that they might be over time, perhaps development of back pain or neck pain that you have to be aware of. Yeah. Are, um, what are some substitutes somebody can do prior to getting surgery? So, so the, the key thing about back pain is what we learned over time is that you're able to address it early on uh, and try to prevent it from becoming chronic, the outcomes are better. And, but, 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 but there's a lot of things that you have to do. First of all, recognize when the issue starts, implement some form of conservative measures. To me, I'm a strong believer in developing a strong core. Uh, controlling your weight as much as you can. No smoking, it's a key too as well because smoking causes degeneration of the spine, bones, disc, cartilage, muscle, you name it. I mean, everything you want to call it. 
Um, and then and then sometimes uh, pain specialists or physiatrists. Physiatrists are a group of, of very specialized uh, sports. They call it sports medicine doctor, but they're they're more than that. They're actually musculoskeletal specialists that can sometimes do blocks or injections. Sometimes burn the nerves that can cause some of the back pain, and it can be tremendous as you try to work and trying to fortify those structures and try to unload the structures of the spine. Uh, and so uh, it, it, sometimes it's preventive, sometimes it's jumping on it early on um, and, and then just, you know, trying to, to avoid uh, uh, extreme measures uh, such as back fusions or neck fusions that can sometimes lead into potential problems in the, in, in the, uh, as we grow and, and develop uh, degenerative changes. Okay. What are some of the most common back problems you've dealt with? Um, a, a lot of times we see a lot of people, I mean, a lot of our patients that we see uh, come in with uh, chronic years, uh, you know, more than six months history of back pain and neck pain. Um, and, and some of them are, are, are induced by some form of injury that they had, uh, playing, work, lifting, moving, that type of things. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's usually in the younger population. We tend to see this type of acute back pain. Uh, an episode they say, I remember when I, when I was playing my kid and something happened, I twisted my back and ever since then I had this, this issue. Um, as we grow older, uh, the degeneration of the spine causes uh, leg pain because then where the nerves are situated that go to our legs, get uh, uh, narrowed called stenosis uh, as the joints and the ligaments and, and the arthritis builds up. And so you, you see a different type of, of, of variability among the patient population. You know, younger people tend to have more chronic back and neck pain. Older patients tend to have some element of back pain, but also leg pain or arm pain. This is scoliosis too, which is, which is you know, it's just something that happens as well too, but. Do you remember seeing a comment along the lines of ASC surgery? Yeah, I think it's an anterior scoliosis correction. Yeah, and I saw that as very common with the younger generation. Yes, 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 yeah. So, so uh, to your point, you know, so at our spine center, uh, scoliosis is something is done in very specialized places. Uh, you know, our, our Yale Spine Center, we have several scoliosis. We call it the Formi specialists, where they, they try to correct that. And, and one of the things that that uh, we see is the aging population, where the the scoliosis is is it's less bendable. Uh, because all the arthritis has caused bone on bone to grow over time. And then you have the younger population that they, they, they had scoliosis, uh, but they're more bendable. And so sometimes uh, we can go from the anterior approach where you go through a lot of scoliosis in younger people sometimes it happens to be in the thoracic or the chest area. And with the help of, of chest surgeons, we can go in, get access to the spine, be very careful around the heart, the aorta, the vena cava, and be able to correct them because they're more bendable. And so you're able to put in constructs to correct that. In the aging population, it, it, we, we, I wish we could tell you that we could do that, but it, 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 the forces are much more demanding. And that's why most of the uh, older population uh, uh, tend to have the surgery from the back. So what kind of surgery do they have? Like just plates and screws yes. with your force? Yeah, so, so usually what happens is that uh, you put screws in different parts of the vertebra and you try to make a, a, a bend, you know, imagine trying to take a hose and very carefully with the forces trying to straighten that, 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 that force by using rods and screws to put it all together straight. Sometimes we have to take out some of the vertebra to be able to create some space because sometimes it could be uh, impeding you know, bones first that we really need to break down to be able to correct them properly so we can get a straight spine as we can and try to get, again, the shoulder above the pelvis, the head above the shoulder. You take out a whole uh, vertebra or just like a portion of it? Uh, sometimes we have to take the whole, sometimes we take a portion, and, and uh, we have to be very careful because we're also working around the nerves on the spinal cord. And so it's, it's almost you create a wet shape uh, so that when you actually can bring it back, you know, the, the, the wedge that we took out now is kissing bone on bone, and that bone on bone can grow together well. Was seeing a chiropractor, would that be a good substitute so you never get scoliosis? I, 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 
Well, in, in my opinion, uh, if you have an x-ray of, of a curvature, uh, it's very difficult to be able to manipulate it uh, just, just by external forces, in my opinion. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because I've, I've been there and it takes an enormous amount of force just being there and putting the screws into it and, and just being able to, to do that. Um, I think chiropractors are very good in helping people, uh, particularly you know developing programs to prevent back pain over time. But 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 to to in my opinion, I, I haven't seen. Um, I, I should be careful. I, I I haven't been presented with a case where the screws was corrected by external forces, except for braces in young people. You know you, tr you can prevent over time a scoliosis from getting worse by putting a brace, and that's something that that it's still in, in the works in terms of who benefits from braces. Uh, we used to brace everybody back in the 80s and, and early 90s. And, and, um, and some people gained some benefits from it. We were able to arrest uh, the curvature uh, 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 degrees. We weren't able to, to completely strain them out, but we were able to prevent it from getting worse. So say it's too late for a preventative procedure, say, or say you're older, you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s and you already have that uh, deformed spine or something along those lines causing pain, but you're too old for surgery, what kind of stuff can you do to just sort of ease the stress or is it too late to even bother trying to straighten your back or anything? Well, it depends. You know, a lot of people with a scoliosis and they have no pain. And so it, it, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, uh, we, we can follow curvatures over time. If they seem to be progressing. Then we actually try to help them develop a stronger bone. You know, a lot of people get bone density testing, they're able to contrast the effects of, we want to prevent somebody with soft bones to become osteoporotic over time. Uh, we educate them as well too. Uh, uh, if surgery necessary, we make sure that we they understand uh, the type of surgery they're gonna go through. Uh, and, and we try to uh, uh, enhance the recovery as much as possible by educating, by making sure that diabetes is controlled, they're not smoking, their bones are strong. Uh, and we also look at whether or not the benefits will outweigh the risk. Uh, to your point, you know, there's some circumstances that we don't have the capacity to, to, to help these patients. And so we try to help them as much as possible in terms of pain management, uh, injections, uh, burning on the nerves and things like that to try to control some of the, the pain. Mm. And also always motivate them to do the exercises because there's a cycle, right? If you, if you are in pain, what do you want to do? Nothing. When you do nothing, the muscles get atrophy. If the muscles get atrophy and you want to walk to go to the bathroom, the muscles saying this is way too much. So you're running a marathon without the proper training. And so that's part of it also, trying to make sure that, that we, we fortify as many structures as we can, depending upon the level of activity that the patient can do. So always try to stay help, uh, healthy if you can. Always, always, yeah. yeah. Seems like the golden rule. <laughs> yeah, that's a general rule, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I've heard um, when you put your hand on a hot surface, your hand will flinch before your brain even realizes your hand's hot, like before you fear, feel any pain or anything. And I've heard this is because you have sort of a quotation second brain in your spine, which reacts to pain like that, like I just mentioned. When you're performing surgery or anything like that, do you ever have to factor in this sort of second brain or? Well, well, I, I call, well, I, I, th I think, well, let's see. So there, there's a there's a concept called a gated channel uh, 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 theory where where, you know, let, let's say I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm hammering you know a, a nail into a wall, and stupidly I instead of a nail I hit my thumb. <laughs> So, so what, what do we do? We, we I, at least I do. I grab that thumb. I start shaking. I start biting on it. And so what I'm sending is two signals. The one the stupid me that hit me. And then the second one is the one I can control by sending the proper frequencies and things like that. And so, and so two signals come to the spinal cord and there's a gated phenomenon that say, okay, I'll let you go over this one first. Maybe hopefully the one that I'm biting my, th you know, by my thumb that controlling the frequency. I'm like, and then there's the one that, you know, the stupid situation. And, and so there's a phenomenon where, where and, and to your point, which is something that's also, we learn and we're learning a lot over time is that, that we can sometimes fool the signals that come from our limbs, our back, uh, into the brain by inserting uh, uh, a, a, a deflector, I call it deflector, but it's really a small little piece of wire called a spinal cord stimulator. 
that stimulates parts of the spinal cord to kind of say, hey, did you see that arm, did you see that neck, uh, the leg pain that's been bothering you for years? How about if I send you the signal here and listen to me rather than the one downstairs? And so we send a signal to the brain that kind of fools the signals coming from the leg. Um, and it's, it tells you there's no pain in your leg. Well, you, you, you kind of, you, you say it's there, but it's, it, it's not killing me like it used to. And it's because we're fooling the, the transmission of signals in the spinal cord. And so it, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that we know for a while. And over time, the technology to be able to implant these little wires on the back or paddles, actually put a couple of paddles that can stimulate the spinal cord can help a lot also with, with the signals coming from portions that hurt us and kind of block them from being so, so divisive in our brain. So you can actually mitigate those signals uh, into the brain. Um, yep. and, oh, go ahead. No, 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 no that's right. Sorry. It, it's a technology that we're still evolving, trying to understand the brain and the spinal cord and how can we bypass uh, with those, those type of signals. Is there a lag in these or like a delay in these signals? There, As in you bang your toe against the bed and you're like, oh, I'm going to feel that in five seconds. Exactly. It's like a couple of milliseconds. And then, you know, you hit it and like, oh, and then it really hits you hard. You're like, oh, I'm really going to jump. So, yeah, it, it, a couple of milliseconds in, in response to that. Yeah. It's part, part of it is it's the transmission of information, but also the processing that goes through. Is that um, wire you mentioned similar to uh, epidurals where you get shot in your back to numb the pain? Right, right. So an epidural, so epidural is the outer layer of the nerve. Uh, so we're, we're, what, what we're trying to do is, uh, so when somebody, let's say somebody has a, a, a herniation of a disc that is pinching on that nerve and it causes an enormous amount of inflammation and you have this horrible leg pain that unrelentless uh, and so pain specialists or physiatrists can go in there on their x-ray guidance into that nerve because we can see where the MRI where the disc is and we can go in there very carefully and inject just a, just a little bit amount of numbing medication and steroid and what that does is the numbing medication sometimes people can see immediate effects not bad if it doesn't work right away but the steroids take a week or two to kind of be able to mitigate the inflammation from that because in some instances, let's say that part of the cartilage is pinching on your nerve, sometimes the body can absorb that. It's called an acute disfragment. And it's sometimes very rewarding when you see that on the MRI, you know it's fresh, you know that patient picked up something and then Doug, I, I, you know, it's like I felt that twinge and then 24 hours later, this pain, the inflammation just kicks in. And we see in the MRI, sometimes those epidurals can help quiet things down as the body absorbs those fragments. But at the same time, the epidurals can help quiet down some of the joints. Sometimes can help us diagnose the problem because you, the, you know, the spine has multiple joints, multiple attachments, multiple nerves. And by blocking certain portions, we can do what we call pain mapping. And if we happen to be lucky enough that we can find a spot that we can then burn the nerve that causes the pain, then it's a win-win situation to the patient because, hey, they don't have to have surgery you don't alter the anatomy and then you help them with the pain and then you do the therapy or the exercise program to help them preventing hopefully that inflammation from coming back but i wish it could be that easy but we sometimes hit those home runs on the patients so. it could be great for like you mentioned uh, inflammation reducing the swellings along those lines yes yeah uh, if uh, if you're numbing the pain could that just will people just rely on constant numbing the pain but there's a reason the pain's there as in you just since you're numbing it, you're just going to make it worse. Constantly walking and using your spine. Yeah, exactly. So that's a good, yeah, thank you for bringing that up because people think, well, I don't want to mask the pain. Well, believe me, the body is really good at protecting yourself. So it's if if, if you really do something, it, it's going to remind you not to do it. So you're not completely, you know, blocking, numbing the the, the input. Uh, you you kind of abating it a little bit and kind of keeping it, you know, kind of quiet so that the body can hopefully regain some form of functionality with it, but, but you don't completely you know, uh, block something. The body, the body will remind you. What about continuing on with pain? We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic where yeah. as a doctor, are you willing to just like prescribe opioids or are you sort of reluctant to, add, cause you need them for some pain, especially when you have severe issues. But again, is there ever something in the back of your head like, oh, I should be careful handing these out. 
Definitely, you know, I think, I think that the opioid crisis has taught us a lot um, uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, because it's not just the pain, it's also a psychological part of it too. Um, and so we're very, very careful. Um, they have, you know, as a, as a, a spine surgeon, I, I prescribe when I operate, because I know what kind of pain they're gonna go through. But then you have to be very cognizant of the the, the, the side effects uh, uh, that these medications cause, not only physical but also psychological. So that's why the development of very specialized pain clinics that that monitor uh, your liver functions, your kidney functions, uh, that that see you on a regular basis, so that you you're not, you know, overstepping your boundaries uh, in terms of taking more medication than you should. I mean, there's a there's a relationship that's being developed, which I think is healthy because I, I think I think we overdid it, um, uh, and and you can see the price that we paid for it. Overdid uh, as in doctors uh, handing out opioids. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like prescribing opioids, uh, you know, become become the uh, the other vital sign, you know, was, and and that that was a marketing propaganda that I, I think we we seen the price that over the past twenty years of what has happened over time. I, I think we, we're changing. Our, our, our attitude. We know the patients are in pain. We try to help them without taking pain medication, opiates. Some people clearly need it. You know, people with cancer, uh, they, they absolutely need it. There's no question about it. Um, uh, and then there's new research coming out to try to to, to, to bypass that, uh, that whole uh, opioid that receptor based uh, uh, mechanism so that uh, we, we know that we can help with the pain because we're actually targeting. We have truly anti-inflammatories that can target specific situation. For example, your rheumatoid arthritis is a medication, you know, it affects your joints, but you're not giving them pain medications. You give them medications that actually help with the rheumatoid huh. part of it. So, so a lot of research is being developed to try to contain that type of situation as well. Too. Okay, so we're able to improve upon what we're handing out so we don't have to just numb the pain with these opioids that can be addictive, we're actually able to target and improve, say, the joints or anything else. Exactly. We're looking at, we're understanding the problem better and we're targeting mechanisms to try to mitigate that problem. Okay. Because I don't, I listen to a podcast for anybody listening, uh, Science Versus is great. One of my favorites. They'll dive into a topic. In this case, this was a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. So I'm not going to try and say anything false because I don't remember too much. But I remember the idea was, a lot of doctors were incentivized to hand out opioids for sort of little uh, bonuses. And that's what created the epidemic. And now Germany has become, they used to have a, I want to say they reduced the amount of opioids they gave out by a quarter, but they took steps in the past 10 years and we should follow their model. Do you know anything of the German model? I don't that's I don't that's know. out of your field, you know? <laughs> no, unfortunately I don't, but, 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 but yeah, this, there were, yes, uh, you know, uh, there are a couple of uh, congressional acts that came out to, to make sure that doctors didn't get incentivized. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, my disclosure, I don't own anything and, and I don't, I don't, I don't do any, you know, I, I don't work for a company or anything like that or, or be a consultant in a company, but, but yes, I, over time, unfortunately, there, there will be some incentivized program where, where people, you, you know, you get invited to these dinner meetings and there's a, you know, a doctor from the community being sponsored by, you know, a, a pharmaceutical company and, and why this drug was better than anything else and things like that. And I, I you know, I was, you know, it was, it was, it was, it's a slippery slope there. Uh, and and I, I, those things have been really, really, really uh, uh, well regulated now. And I'm glad to see that, to be honest with you. That's good. Speaking of, well, a new alternative that people are talking about and it can be good for inflammation from what I hear. What are your thoughts on medical marijuana being used? Uh, big time. I, I'm a big, I, I believe it a hundred percent. I see a lot of patients that, that, uh, you know, uh, the stigma has been, you know, erased uh, finally uh, over time. Um, and I, I see, I see a lot of benefits in some patients and, and, and uh, of, of, of a wide variety of ages. And I recommend that as well too. I, I I think uh, that now that I, yeah, I think the past uh, the federal law against uh, becoming criminalized or something like that. So I think that's going to open the market, and I and we're going to learn from these things too as well. And it's not only for pain; it's also for epilepsy and things like that. That you see the results, and, and 
I wish it would have had it uh, much earlier. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Do you ever see yourself in the future uh, prescribing medical marijuana for one of your tr uh, patients? I, I personally don't because I, like, I, like, like any doctor, you feel comfortable with the medications that you give because you know, you know you're going to do that. But I, 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 I have given to patients, uh, doctors that, that are prescribed, you know, you got to get a car and things like that in a heartbeat. So I, I don't prescribe it directly, but I definitely prescribe it indirectly. All right, just about wrapping it up. Now to throw out a political question, what's your view on Medicare for all? <laughs> uh, uh, <yeah. laughs> uh, well, I, I think I think there's some good things about it, uh, and and uh, and I think I think uh, well, l let me give you what what I I try not to be too political about the situation, but um, uh, I, I spent some time in London. Uh, uh, I spent three months uh, in London, and I saw uh, what uh, socialized medicine is all about. And I thought I thought it was great because uh, they have access to these incredible surgeons that were unbelievable. Um, uh, but then there's also the private sector of it that you really, in my opinion, you, you, they they pay good money and they got also very good care. And so I, I guess I guess I guess uh, I'm a little bit ambivalent because like, I saw both sides of it. Um, um, my, my concern is how we're going to pay for this this whole situation, and, and that's 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 the hardest thing. Um, I, I I think I think people in Medicare get great access to great great doctors and things like that, but I I think I'm afraid that we we might not have enough money in the future to be able to. To, to provide the care that that uh, I think we all deserve, so so uh, I see I see both sides of it, but it's, it's becoming very expensive. I I used to be a business owner uh, when I was in Texas, and I, you know we, we could provide medical insurance uh, to our employees, and and every year that the, the price was just humbling, humbling. Uh, and so I don't know. I, I I think it's a good thing if we can afford it. How's that? <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Makes sense. Is there any uh, final topic along the spine that you want to address? Um, no, basically, I, I, you know, I always, uh, I'm a firm believer of, of, you know, take care of yourself as we talked earlier. Uh, try to avoid smoking. Uh, alternative therapies are incredibly good for everybody. Uh, if they can manage that very well. Uh, you know, if you get off for surgery, always, always look for second opinions. It doesn't hurt. You got to be well educated. The better educated you are, uh, I, I live by the loss of regret. You know, you never regret a decision if, if you know that you did every single step to try to understand better the options and the circumstances. Uh, and, and we're not all doctors, but but uh, but uh, it, it's it's uh, you can get very well educated uh, during your process. And it, it never hurts uh, unless you have uh, something that's life threatening that is going to get you paralyzed. Uh, um, you know, cancer, oncology type of things. Uh, you know, always, always keep in mind that I, I'm sorry you're in pain, but 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 think about getting better educated because unfortunately I, I've done it myself where I caused more pain than I wanted to in, in my patients. And it, it just it just just uh, it's something that you. But I know my patients have been very very well educated before I we end up you know endeavor to any type of surgery. So sounds good. And thank you, Doctor Bartolome for coming out to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. And call me anytime if you want to talk about something else in the future. Sounds good. This has been The Way Podcast. If you want to know more about The Way Podcast, go to podcasttheway.com. As always, deuces.